Very good morning to all of you who are joining online as well as in person. Very warm welcome once again to the day three of the 133rd anniversary International Medical Conference. And today, we have a really exciting program lined up before us, and we'll be starting with a very exciting plenary with the title, Digital Delights and Spectacular Social Media in Continuum Professional Development. Our plenary speaker this morning is Dr. Lawrence Sherman, who is world-renowned international medical educationist, who has played a leading role in continuous professional development and faculty development. And he's very well known for his entertaining performances. And he'll be joining us from USA uh, at midnight this time. Thank you, Lawrence. And we are looking forward to your performance and the session. Over to you. I'll be sharing my screen now. and. Uh then we'll get, in, get it onto the presentation. I can tell you that uh, it is my honor and my pleasure to be a part of this wonderful conference. As my dear friend, Professor, uh, Professor Karun, Karuna Talake has said, I'm a medical educationalist and have been a medical educationalist for 26 years. If you see on the left side of your screen, that's what I looked like maybe 30 years ago. If you look on the right side of your screen, you can see what I look like. My goal is to talk to you today about the breadth of all health professions education and how digital delights and spectacular social media can help all of us be better educators and also be better learners. Because if you think about this, every one of us has committed to a lifetime of lifelong learning. And as the way we teach changes, the way we learn changes, and the way we learn has to adopt and adapt to the, the current situation. Well, I am truly humbled to be a part of this conference. And uh, as Indika said, I'm in Virginia. I'm very close to uh, Washington, DC. It's just 15 miles down the road. And it is indeed, as I look at my clock, 11.35 PM here. Uh, but I'm glad to be part of your daytime. When we originally talked about this, I was going to be in the beautiful city of Colombo with you, uh, a place I've never been. And hopefully, if you like this presentation today, maybe I'll get invited back for the 134th conference, and we could all be there together. Now, you have a wonderful president uh, of your association, and, and it's so humbling to have been invited by, by him, my dear friend. You know, just down the road, we have a president here in the United States, but I will not get political. Uh, some of the rules to make this a, a, an engaging presentation. I've built in a couple of polls, and I've also built in some questions where you can enter some information into the chat box. Now, that's for those of you that are watching live and can participate. Those of you that are watching the archive understand that we're doing this so that we can engage and we're demonstrating the best practice and how digital education can engage the room. So if you are able to vote in your polls, please vote in those polls if you're watching the archive. And if you can enter into the chat box any information, please enter it there as well. And my goal will be to see that information later. But please do interact with me because I think the goal of any educational experience, whether it be digital or live, and whether we be using this platform or whether we be using social media is to engage in a conversation and not just to have me talk to you. I want to hear from you and have you talk to me. Now, here's my first poll, and I'll launch this now. So what I want to understand is from those of you who are participating, does digital education have a place in health professions education overall. Uh, I, I'm good. I see you're starting to vote, so this is very good. Please vote now if you can, because it's important for me to understand what you're thinking now so that I can tailor my talk to meet those needs. And it's great to see that the first few people have, that have voted have, say, have said yes. I, I was hoping that nobody would say no to this, but please continue to vote. I'll close the polling in a moment. Okay, so as I share the results with you, I've said yes, I'm glad that we're starting to use it and others 
have already used it. And that's a good thing. And it's, it's good for me to know that. Um, and by the way, if the, I, I've taken the polling down, if it still appears on your screen, you could always hit the button that says close. Well, so I think that we're in a, a space of digital transformation. We're in a place where those of us that never had to teach using digital platforms and those of us who have never had to learn using digital platforms now in the, the age of this pandemic, we've all had to adapt, right? So uh, I've changed what I call myself. I, I think all medical and health professions educators, uh, while there, there'll always be teachers, I consider myself a global inspirational learning facilitator. And those last two words are the important words to me. I think our job is to make sure that learning happens. It's not just that we're experts in our subject, but it's we're making sure that the people that we're teaching, whether it's undergraduate educators teaching students, postgraduate educators teaching trainees, or people like me, CPD educators, are teaching those of us who are already in practice. And sometimes those are the hardest people to teach because we have to get them to, to forget what they've learned before and to learn what's new and, and what they should be doing. The biggest obstacle for me is this term B T T W W A D I. Sounds like a, a strange word, but it's it's when people say to me, "That's the way we've always done it," so that's the way we have to do it. And that's either when they say, "This is the format in which I want to teach," or when they say, "Okay, I'll teach using digital tools." but I'll only do it the way I've always taught live. And we all know that we can't do things the same digitally as we do live. The, this lady on the right was one of the first computer scientists uh, and she's Harvard, Harvard educated. She was in the US Navy. And I love this. This is one of my favorite quotes where she said, humans are allergic to change. They love to say, we've always done it this way. And she tried to fight that. And that's why she has a clock on her wall that runs the opposite way. Still tells the time, but it runs the opposite way. And this is key. We have to think differently so that we can achieve the best outcome. So now the folks at Gartner came up with these great definitions. And, and I, I like to use them because we all use these terms innovation. We hear the term disruption all the time now. But what do we mean by that? Well, to me, I think innovation means doing the same things we've always done, but doing them a bit better. So being innovative is being a little bit creative. Being disruptive is making things that make the old things obsolete. So if we're now using digital education, if we're now using social media, we're using them so that what we've done before becomes the old normal. And what we do now is the new normal. So uh, let me ask you this. Are we, in your opinion, experiencing disruption or innovation? And you see this little logo here where it says chat box? This is that time where I'd like you to enter things into the chat box. And we have one of the SLMA people are watching the chat box for me, and they can jump in and tell us what you're writing in that chat box. But the question for you is, are we experiencing disruption, meaning we're changing everything so that we don't go back completely to the old way, or are we just changing things slightly, innovation? So while you're entering that, and, and to my friend at, at SLMA, uh, if you wanna jump in and tell me what people write, you can do that. I'm gonna move on for the sake of time. So, so if you think about it, um, I'm good, I see people are using chat. So I, I, I think many of us have had to leave our comfort zone. Many of us have had to say, okay, I was very comfortable doing things the old way. Now I have to do things the new way. And, and I saw this t-shirt uh, on social media and I, I took a picture of it. This is the, the funniest thing. How many of us have been on a call, a Zoom call or some other digital call or meeting where someone's talking, you see their lips moving, but you can't hear them. And everybody else is either saying to them or typing in the chat box, hey, hey. And so the person has to say, oh, sorry, I was on mute didn't really happen that much when we were teaching live. Maybe we had a microphone that wasn't turned on, but we were never in, in a, an environment where people couldn't hear us. 
So, so what are these delights of digital learning and education? Well, in our world of CME and CPD, digital learning has always been a key part of CME. E-learning was built in in the early, early days. If you think of the big innovators like Medscape, who I'm sure all of you know, they early on knew that uh, digital platforms were a good place for education to be delivered. And so we've always done that. So I think those of us that are in CME and CPD had a little bit easier time when the pandemic hit and we had to shift from live to digital. But I think lessons can be learned from the space that we live in and how can we apply these best practices? And we'll talk a, a little bit later. And you guys are doing a great job here in doing live and online and blended learning. You're doing it right here. You have people together in a room. I can't see you, but I assume you're appropriately socially distanced, et cetera, et cetera. But we're also delivering the content digitally and the, the people will be able to watch this later. If you think about it, that's the best of all worlds. And I think that's what we need to be thinking about. And I think when people say to me, what's the biggest change we're going to see when the pandemic is over? I think we're going to see a huge change from live conferences and live education to the best of both worlds so that now more people can participate using more platforms. The live conference won't go away. The live education won't go away, but we're going to be more creative and more innovative in how we can bring in digital participants. Because wouldn't it be great if we can take what we learn now and use it later and help more people participate in more forms of education and information? And if you think about it, there's lots of platforms. And I know that oftentimes cost is an issue. And, and I often have to lecture in LMICs, low and middle income countries. And I think one of the things to think about is that there are a variety of platforms, many of which are available free or at low cost, and certainly at low cost for educational institutions. Also grants are available for purchasing these kinds of products. I think we need to match the product to what we're trying to do and not try to fit what we're trying to do into a platform. The other thing is digital learning can support all learning styles. We have to remember that when we're teaching digitally and when we're learning digitally, we have to do it in a place where we're comfortable and that the type of learning we, we, we're looking for and the type of teaching and learning facilitation we're trying to do needs to be able to be used. But my favorite phrase has always been, and I've been lecturing on digital education for over 20 years, it's you have to embrace the power of the platform. Don't just take what you did before and just use it on the platform now. Early on when e-learning was happening, there were lots of places that were just taking printed content and putting it up onto the web. Well, I can read it in a book, I can read it in a journal. That doesn't do it. You have to use the platform for what and how it was intended to be used. And if you think about it, when you think about all the different learning styles, and I'm not here to teach you about all the learning styles, but if you look at all those different types, and you'll be able to read these uh, in follow-up, every one of these learning styles can be used and embraced with e-learning. But the educators and instructional designers need to be sure that they're thinking about this and they need to know their audience. When you're a teacher or a learning facilitator, you have to know who you're teaching, what their expectations are, and how you set it up. That's why I built the polls in here. That's why I asked the folks at SLMA who'd be in the audience, what's their background, because I want to make sure that this is for you. When you're teaching, you are there for the people that are learning. And when you're learning, the people are there to help and facilitate your learning. You have to remember that. And digitally, we can do that. Just recently, Redmi and Jones published uh, a framework on designing and delivering effective uh, digital education. Again, I'm not here to teach you about this, and, and I think that the diagram's a bit um, crowded, but understand that there are people now, educators and theoreticians, who are thinking about the most effective way to design, develop, and deliver effective digital education. And we're going to get to social media in a minute. I know that was uh, another part of the topic. We're, we're almost there. But understand that we need to think about this. So, so we have to apply a framework and we have to use backwards planning. We have to think, what are we trying to accomplish? So for this session, for instance, 
the backwards planning is my goal was to take 30 minutes and bring you into a conversation about digital learning and social media. So that's what I use to design this with some examples, with some uh, engagement tools. I'm trying to model for you best practices in digital education, because I think the least effective education is when someone just talks to you, doesn't involve you, and hasn't spent the time to think about who you are and what you need. But if you think about good digital learning, you need good teachers. And my good friend and mentor, uh, Ronald Harden, recently wrote the book, The Eight Roles of the Medical Teacher. And uh, William Arthur Ward said that the mediocre teacher tells, the good teacher explains, the superior teacher demonstrates. But remember what, when I said inspirational learning facilitator, the great teacher inspires. So the great teacher is a great teacher regardless of the platform that they use. So for those of us that have to teach and want to teach and like me have a passion for teaching or facilitating learning, we have to remember that our goal is to inspire you. If one of you that watches this live or watches the archive says, I want to be a better digital educator, I want to better use social media in my education, then I've done my job. So when you think about those eight roles, I, again, we don't have to talk about all of them, but understand, Ronald said, long before I called myself a GILF, one of the roles is a facilitator and a mentor. So you have to be able to take the information and facilitate and mentor the folks and students and learners span the entire continuum of health professions education. When we're a student, we're thirsty for knowledge. We have an open mind. We're learning everything for the first time. In CPD, we sometimes have to get rid of that educational residue that people have stuck in their brains saying, well, that's the way I've always done it. I don't need to change. We have to remove that to, to create that teachable moment and say, I want to inspire you to learn something new. Remember the beauty of digital learning. I don't know where you are. I'm sitting in my living room in my home in Fairfax, Virginia, but the learning happens where, when, and how you can or want to learn. And sometimes learning, even digital learning, is incidental or informal. You could be having a conversation with someone at a conference, at a restaurant, at, at your child's school, and you can learn something that's applicable to your daily practice. Well, that's incidental learning. In digital learning, that happens all the time. You could be scanning social media, you could be reading a journal, you could be doing a lot of different things. You could be having a a WhatsApp or a Facebook Messenger conversation, and all of a sudden you learn something. So this happens digitally, and that's great. And and what you can do here is, and I don't know if you've heard this term before, but you create your own personal learning network. And your own personal learning network, you put that together using social media and digital groups and a variety of other uh, information uh, providing tools. And you put that together because each one of us is different, because each one of us has different educational needs, professional needs, and you're able to use a variety of resources and sources to put together your personal learning network. And that changes and grows and evolves over time. And that's beautiful. And so you need to be able to do that. I did a faculty needs assessment recently for a webinar that I was developing. And a lot of faculty who have to teach had lots of challenges in moving from teaching live to teaching digitally. And these are some of the themes that, that emerged. But the one thing that came through clearly, and I've also done a, a student needs assessment, was that students and faculty are both struggling with trying to figure out how to behave, learn, and adapt to the new normal, and how to use the platforms to the best of their abilities as learners and as teachers. And so these faculty have evolved and they're using the e-learning and they're evolving and they're growing and they're growing even in places that they may not have wanted to or knew they had to. And they're having to test and assess in these new environments. And, and I think what we're seeing here is we're seeing a beautiful change. Here's my second poll. And I know I only have eight minutes left, so I'm going to guide you through this pretty quickly. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to launch my next poll. Uh, hold on one sec, I want to give you the other poll. 
Here's the second poll. I'm just curious that do you use social media as a part of your professional practice? If you can vote uh, quickly, I'd appreciate it so that I can get to the rest of my content. So please vote now. Okay, for the sake of time, I'm just going to show you that, again, here we have lots of yeses. Uh, more people say, I think it helps me find education information. Some people say rarely, but I think what's important is that you're doing it. And, and something that <laughs> I was talking about just earlier today was you at SLMA are doing a great job of using social media. And I'm really impressed. And I hope that all of you are doing it. And if you could put in the chat box how you're using social media. But what I'm seeing is individually, your president and organizationally, your association have used social media very well to promote and talk about this conference and to deliver this conference. And I think that's really key. And uh, as we move through this, social media are incredibly important in health professions education. We've learned this in the CPD space because they are spectacular in CPD. If you think about CPD, we develop education based on educational education, and we use uh, social media at every time point in the entire educational journey in CPD. We do educational needs assessment, we find and recruit faculty, we promote the activity as you're doing, we deliver the activity or we enhance the activities. So if an activity has, was meant to be live face-to-face, we can have people who are live tweeting from the activity or sharing it, or we can share it on Facebook Live or on YouTube, and we can do our assessment and evaluation. So understand that social media in CPD have been demonstrated to be spectacular. And I understand that most people who use social media use social media for their own personal use. You can think about and take a step back how you can use those same skills that you use personally professionally. And I hope that some of you are thinking about that as you see the way SLMA have been using it. And I would be happy in follow-up to this, if any of you have questions about how best to do it, to, to contact me and, and the folks at SLMA can help you contact me to say, how can we best use social media or digital education? I would love to be a resource for any and all of you to help you to better use digital education and social media. So uh, with the, the few minutes I have left, and, and if there is time for q and I'd love to be able to take some, I'd like you to be thinking about these four points. I think everybody needs to be open to using existing and new media across health professions education. And if you think about it, we've been forced to do it. The worst thing, in my opinion, that could happen is when the pandemic is gone. That, that would be a good thing. But the worst thing that could happen after that is that we stop using the digital education and we stop using the social media and we go back to the way things were because I think we're gonna make things better by using more of the social media. And I think that's, that's incredible and digital platforms. And I think you have to remember, don't let price be a, a barrier. There are ways to get these platforms at low and no cost it may take some work, but you can do it. And if you can't do that, or time is an obstacle, or resources is an obstacle, there are free platforms that you can use to deliver some of your content. You could also mix platforms. So there's no reason why we couldn't have a Google Doc open right now, where you guys were, instead of using the chat box, entering information into a Google Doc, or polls within a Google Doc, or using Poll Everywhere and embedding that in here. There's so many things that you can do using digital tools and social media to make sure that you're making your education as best it can be. But you can't do it without the right training. And I know even as, as uh, I was talking to the SLMA folks in preparation for this, they were saying, oh, we'll run your slides for you and we'll run your polls. And I said, no, you know what? I'm comfortable. I can run my polls. I can run my slides. I can be in control of it. But I couldn't do it until I had the right training and I'm speaking at a variety of conferences. Every one of them uses a different platform. Every one of them provides training. And for as good as I think I am sometimes, I go through the training every single time because I learn something new every single time. 
and not every platform is the same. And the last point I'd like you to consider and ponder and think about is the new normal that we've had to use and, and embrace is not going away. And if it does go away, I think it's a mistake. With that, I'll say thank you. And I think there's two minutes left. I'll turn it back over Indica or XLMA folks, if you want to take over, I'm happy to stop sharing my screen and show you my face much bigger here. Thank you, Lawrence, for that exciting presentation. Uh, just one question. Traditionally, we don't ask questions in plenaries, but uh, I know that you love to interact. Just one question. Now, uh, as you mentioned, SLM is trying a lot to reach to the audience through social media. And this time, we'll be sharing our scientific presentation and the recordings of the, the research presentations of the SLM sessions in social media. There is a bit of a concern that social media, it will be public forum. So uh, should it be limited only for the, say, scientific journals, or should we, should we go public and maybe through social media? What do you think? Good question. And I, I think it, the real question is, what are you trying to accomplish and who would benefit from the information? So if you think that there's a larger health professions community who would benefit from it, I think you have the ability to share it more broadly. I think. Um, the goal of social media is to promote wider distribution and interaction. And if, you're, if you can manage the process and you can launch it to a larger audience and get feedback and comments from that larger audience, I think that's okay. Because if you think about it, once materials are presented, they're in the public domain. And so if they're in the public domain, isn't it nice that you're able to control the message that goes with it, the message that you want to go with it, rather than letting other people commenting on it without your involvement. So if you do it the right way, I think you could be very successful in launching it to a larger audience. Thank you, Professor Lawrence Sherman, my friend Lawrence, for that exciting presentation and joining us at midnight from US. So from SLME, again, let's thank Lawrence Sherman for that exciting presentation in our traditional way. With that, We'll be concluding this session and moving to the next session.